Welcome, Carm Capriato, the Service Aftermarkets Podcast Pioneer, with the gold standard of aftermarket business podcasts. Join me for aftermarket insights as we advance the aftermarket. And as always, know that you'll learn just one thing. Find us on your favorite podcast listening app and RemarkableResults.biz or on my YouTube channel. Hey everybody, Carm Capriato, Remarkable Results Radio here at the 44th Annual Training Event and Trade Show. Max, the Mobile Air Climate Systems Organization, been around a long time. My first time here, I'm at the Rosen Center, Orlando, Florida. It's been a blast. I mean, you talk about learning a ton of stuff here with all these great interviews that we're doing. And over three days, 35 speakers, 70 hours of mobile and AC vehicle thermo management training. I just don't do air conditioning, Joe. I do thermal management training. I introduce you to Joe Long. Well, thank you, Carm, for bringing me in, talking about coolants and DEF today. Yeah. I've been in the business of trucking for probably 50 years, since 1973. A lot of folks don't know what a Brockway is, but that was a truck, a vocational truck, refuse and concrete, c- cement type of vocational vehicle in the Northeast. And uh, Mac bought them back back then in 72 or 71. My first foray was to crawl under one of those trucks and say, I don't want to do this work anymore. Wow. So uh, I've been in trucking since then. I own my own Mac parts dealership for a short period of time. Really? Yeah. Yeah. In Stanford, Connecticut. And I closed those doors somewhere around 2003 and went to work for Penray uh, for about 10 years. And I've been with Old World the past 10 years, yeah. about to celebrate my 10-year celebration in April 1st. Good for you. Old World Industries. Uh, Peak? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah. Peak is a brand. Yeah, uh, Peak is a brand. Yeah, and you... Old World Industries is the parent company, privately owned, family business. The children now are taking it to the next generation, P- people like to say, in a family. 51 years this year, we celebrated a big party for 50 years in October. Yeah. Peak is, like I mentioned, Old World Industries is the parent company. Peak is a brand. Yeah. Yeah. We private label 163 different coolants. I can go through various coolants. We private label a lot in the heavy duty from the Alliance brand for Freightliner yeah. and yeah. to Detroit's brand to Navistar International Truck and Engine. And Volvo Mac, that's a big play for us. And probably a lot of the products that my listener uses in their shop. Oh, sure. And the light duty, Mopar. We all know who Mopar is. Do you do Napa? We do a lot of Napa work, a lot. We private label a lot of coolants across the automotive yeah. industry. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's amazing how important a company like Old World is to suppliers that need and want to have a quality product. In your particular case, it seems like you may be the go-to company out there. Well, we are a lot. We're a lot of hands-on, a lot of training. I'm a senior field technical trainer. A lot of the business that I do is heavy duty, but I'm brought into automotive on a regular basis. Cooling system failures, as you talk about antifreeze itself, over 40% of engine downtime is coolant related in the diesel engine world. You see, that's an interesting stat. A ton of our listener that have great shops in the aftermarket, either have fleets or are going after fleets to complement their business. And if they don't know enough about the fleet business and the fleet care, this is a great episode to listen to because I know you're going to talk a lot about SRC and DEF, and we're going to explain those acronyms here in a minute. SCR, let's go. Oh, SCR. <laughs> what did I say? What did I say? S- SRC. <laughs> Oh my God! I can't so we believe gotta, it. We got to educate you. Yeah, S C R. Yes, okay. selective catalytic reduction. That's on the diesel exhaust fluid world. Yeah, yeah. Every diesel engine that's greater than seventy four horsepower must have an SCR system. This is just the the law before emission controls, and we need to lower the detrimental effects of what comes out of an exhaust pipe. So, in your world, and we'll talk about the automotive world. A lot of pickup trucks are Cummins powered. And Cummins uses the SCR system. It's a must. And Cummins actually puts a bulletin out stating that more than 40% engine downtime is coolant related. Also, the American Truckers Association, I'm a member of the American Truckers Association, the Technology and Maintenance Council. I write a lot of bulletins. Right now, I'm the chairman for battery electric vehicle coolants. So I'm writing right now, we need to learn about coolants that are 
going to be filled and how to maintain them, how to treat them, how to test them, what's different about them. So right now we're writing the recommended practice at TMC for battery electric vehicle coolants. What's this all about? Well, you've got a vehicle that's filled with something from whether it's Gillig bus or Nova bus or Ryan bus, New Flyer bus, or Freightliner and Navistar or Packar and Volvo Mac. What coolant's in there? What's different than an in, in, internal combustion engine? We need to know these answers. So that's why we're writing these bulletins to kind of explain to the end user. When you use a lot of conventional coolants, we'll call it conventional coolants or current coolants that we use today, you have certain electricity that runs through that cooling system. So we need to meet certain specifications, lower micro Siemens or electricity running through that system. So it's important that we write this up. Battery electric electric vehicles charge up, and this is part of the recommended practice, they charge up between, now use 40 degrees to 80 degrees, and you can get a, a good charge, upwards of 90%. But when you get below 40 degrees, those batteries won't take a charge. So if you're out ice cold out there and uh, below 30 degrees, you're not gonna charge those batteries 10, 12, 15%. And excessive heat, the same way. So those batteries, if you can think about this, they, those batteries in the summer need to be cooled and in the winter they need to be warm. They need to operate at an optimal temperature. So it's a, a lot of antifreeze is used in battery electric vehicles. The other thing, in most battery electric vehicles, there are more than one system of coolant. So in a typical diesel engine, you have one system. It's producing heat, it's keeping things cool. The engine is getting cooled by this one cooling system. In a battery electric vehicle, you actually have coolant, which is keeping the batteries either warm or cool. You gotta keep all those electric motors, you have to keep them at a certain temperature. And then you're producing HVAC. How much is HVAC uh, doing to cool and warm the battery? Well, they're three th separate systems. Three separate systems. Yeah, so a, a typical system or a vehicle, the coolant is used for the batteries only. Then you have a separate cooling system that is cooling the motors. So you've got various motors that are giving you drive in that vehicle. Coolant is used for there. And then you have a, a coolant that's producing heat or keeping the HVAC system operating. So you actually have three different cooling systems. Are you making the coolant for every one of those? No, no, of course not. But it's interesting, and a lot of end users don't know this, but we know that GM has been factory filling with DexCool for how many years? Since 1995, right? Wow. 29 years. Same exact coolant. For hasn't the, changed, huh? Hasn't changed. Wow. 29 years. <clears throat> Why did they brand it themselves? We can buy DexCool anywhere, right? Well, it, the label... You pay licensing fees. Texaco created the formula back in 1995. GM embraced it. It was not accepted in the diesel engine world. So GM embraced it. It was dyed orange to distinguish it against green right, conventional Right, I coolant. remember that. Right, and it had its issues. Compatibility with certain components in a GM vehicle, whether it was exhaust manifold gaskets or seals or O-rings, and there were some issues. A lot of folks didn't know what it was all about, and they would top off with green conventional coolant because they didn't know what this orange stuff was so that was the first move towards what we call <laughs> I, orange stuff right? that is just one of the always lazy steps that we would take as an industry to say oh, that doesn't matter yeah so so it did matter yeah. uh, you did not want to put a green conventional coolant which was inorganic acid technology on top of this new dex cool which was organic acid technology totally different inhibitor packages they didn't blend very well so you look at today with, with G GM and the GM Bolt, if you want to call it that, their electric vehicle, yeah. that's factory filled with DexCool. So you may see <laughs> battery electric vehicle coolant on the shelf and it's orange in color for GM vehicles. It's still the same exact as the internal combustion engine. You've got your Prius and Toyota that's been red for how many years, right? That's an organic acid technology, Asian formula. The same exact coolant goes into a battery electric vehicle. The big change, the big study we're doing today in all of our labs, whether it's Chevron or Shell or Old World, the big thing that we're all studying is when we move towards 
the change, which will be hydrogen powered battery electric vehicle. Those, these coolants today will not work in those systems. Mm -hmm. So all research is going into there. Really? They're looking at waterless coolants. They're looking at glycerins. And so a lot of studies going into this. We have a PhD doctor at Old World, Dr. Chen. He, this is his one goal is to just study this every single day. Imagine a product like Dexcool has 28 years of long legs. Yeah of continuous service in this product. Does that ever happen? Really rarely happen? Well, Toyota has been 20 years on their red side, okay. on their All red. Right. There's been certain OEs that have looked at formulas. You know, we know what failed way back in 97, 98, 99, when Dexcool was introduced to these systems, we know what failed. So as a, another OE introduced Dexcool to their engines, there were some issues, some failures, so they moved away from it. GM is the only, only one I know today, and again, this is my opinion, that uses Dexcool as a factory fill. No one else uses Dexcool. What about all the other platforms, ma vehicle manufacturers? Are they using some form of organic? 100% the factory fill today okay. across the world. So whether it's Asian vehicles, European vehicles, or here in North America, 100% on road, is organic acid technology. Okay, and so in your gallon of peak, it's organic. Well, we still sell conventional coolant, okay. which is green. There's a lot of old time vehicles, classic cars, if you want to call them, Got your it. 65 yeah, Mustang, yeah, yeah, your yeah. 70 Dodge Challenger, yeah. you should use green conventional coolants in there. If that system's never been changed and rebuilt the engine, new engine or something, you should use green conventional coolants. Yeah. You if you've got old farm equipment that you're working on, you know, something that's a 1980s, 80, 90s farm equipment, use green conventional coolant. Even if you've got a refuse truck or a convention, a cement mixer that Mac has been around a long time, right? If you've got a conventional type of vehicle like that, you should use green coolant in that with the proper inhibitors to inhibit it for the diesel engine. Hey, it's no secret. We're facing a technician shortage and Napa Auto Care has a solution with the Napa Auto Care Apprentice Program. The program was pioneered by one of our own. Pete McNeil and Master Technician Jeg Sorensen from McNeil's Auto Care in Sandy, Utah, realized that the problem of not having technicians available for hire was not going to solve itself and decided to take action and look at a different audience of individuals available for hire. A focus was put on younger individuals with the right passion, desire, and attitude to work in the automotive repair industry. Jake and Pete sought after these individuals and developed a technician apprentice program to give them the training needed to become a successful technician in today's world. The NAPA Auto Care Apprentice Program includes a comprehensive nine-stage curriculum that includes a variety of types of training, and they are classroom training videos exclusive to the apprentice program. Now, these videos provide in-depth training from a successful master technician. Also, Autotech classes with instructor-led courses offered through Napa Autotech and Autotech eLearning. This web-based eLearning is designed to target specific training topics. And finally, hands-on learning. The apprentice will apply the skills gained from the classroom training videos, Autotech instructor-led training, and Autotech eLearnings in the shop with the guidance of a mentor. The apprentice program curriculum is competency-based, meaning an apprentice can move through each stage at a pace that best suits them. Most apprentices complete the program within two years. Upon completion, apprentices will have earned ASE G1, A4, A5, and AC certifications, adding industry validation to the skills an apprentice acquires. Look, having an apprentice in your shop will ultimately benefit your bottom line as they advance through the program. And in most cases, as the apprentice develops their skill set producing billable hours, you'll begin to see a growth in your gross profit by stage five. One of the largest barriers to entry for individuals looking to enter the automotive repair industry is the cost of tools. Now, keep your apprentice motivated with an apprentice toolkit. Now, Napa Auto Care has worked with our supplying partners to offer an exclusive comprehensive tool set, including a four-drawer tool card for all registered apprentices. Hey, to learn more, members can visit member.napaautocare.com. What would be a crossover year that I need to worry about? Well, each OE changed at a certain time. Okay. So we know GM changed in 1995. You look at Ford and Chrysler early 2000s and then the Asians and Europeans early 2000s. Okay, so, but you got to pay attention. You got to look it up. Yeah. yeah, you should look it up. And the big way to know the change is color. 
So I write act an actual bulletin for TMC, the Technology and Maintenance Council, RP, Recommended Practice 351. We're about to review it at our meetings later this month. It's based on colors. It's a recommendation, remember that, a recommended practice. We recommend that if you're, you have a conventional coolant, it stay green. If you have a heavy duty extended life coolant in a diesel engine factory fill as red. If you're working in some sort of propylene glycol world, there's very few vehicles that operate with that type of product. And we recommend it to be blue. We've seen the motorcraft, the gold motorcraft coolant for Ford. They stopped factory filling with that a few years ago. So we kind of kind of color code coolant coming down. As Toyota, like I mentioned a couple of times, they've been red for a number of years. You've got certain vehicle manufacturers, whether Asia or Europe, we've got hot pink coming out of Asia. We got violet coming out of Europe. Here in North America, we have fuchsia color. Old World's Fleet Charge, which is just a product brand that was developed in the 80s to get away from conventional green coolant in the heavy duty world. And Detroit and Cummins and Mac, they all needed to kind of move, start to move away from automotive coolant, which had a lot of phosphates in it, had some high silicates in it. So they developed the formula, Old World, with the study from Detroit, Mac, and so on. We developed the coolant called Flea Charge, which we call a fully formulated coolant. That was your first change away from green coolant to give you a diesel heavy duty coolant. And that was fuchsia in color. We changed the color so you could distinguish green was automotive and fuchsia was heavy duty and worked very well for many years. And the big change that came along in heavy duty and in the industry was fabricated aluminum radiators. Where are we today here? From Max, right? We're here at their event here in Orlando. And the change to fabricated aluminum radiator, the inhibitor that's in some of these heavy duty coolants called nitrites, they're there to protect the block from cavitating, the liners from pitting, and cooling system issues. They coat the engine, except that nitrites and fabricated aluminum, in many instances, they don't like each other. We had a lot of fallout, a lot of dropout, and a lot of failure. Okay, I own a, my car. I think there's 75,000 miles on my car. Should, the next time I go in, would I be expecting the shop to test my coolant just for S and Gs? Well, the coolants that are factory filled today in the automotive world are five year, 150,000 mile coolants. Across the board. That's where Dexco stated it, and then everybody just kind of followed. So in the automotive world, five years, 150,000 miles is what is dictated or, or published. So at, a, at somewhere in that 100 to 150 mark, that coolant should be drained, the system just flushed out and refilled. That's the simple mark for it. A lot of technicians, they don't know the five simple test procedures that can be done in a shop. But if I got a water pump that's weeping and I know I'm going to change it, you're probably saying, Carm, you got to put new coolant in there. Right. Now, why is that water pump weeping? What was added to your cooling system that wasn't compatible is a question we have to ask. Right. Right. So just kind of use some five simple test procedures. Everybody that's listening to this, they should really write these down or reach out and get this publication about testing coolant. There's a recommended practice at TMC RP365 that repeats this. What I'm about to tell the technicians that are listening to this episode. We'll make sure it's in the show notes. Go right. ahead. So A, look at the color. I don't care if it's orange, I don't care if it's blue or, or Asian hot pink, whatever color it is, as long as it's a vibrant color. I don't want it to be black or brown. Take the coolant sample, you only need an ounce or two out of a system, put it in a clear cup or a clear little jar, look up at the light, make sure it's clear. We don't want to see any oil at all, no carbon in there, no transmission fluid, no fuel in any reason. You want to look through that sample. So color and clarity. The third test is pH. Well, we don't have pH meters. We don't have pH test strips. Okay, simply smell it. If it smells like ammonia, you have a rise in pH. The yeah. system is becoming ammonia and it's gonna tear apart every soft metal in the system, O-ring, head gasket, seal, you're gonna have some huge- Where's the ammonia smell coming from? A counter reaction between a lot of fabricated aluminum and the inhibitors got that it, are in cool. Got it, because they don't get along. They just don't, they're not compatible. And because you smell ammonia, it, that means it's becoming toxic, right? It's, well, you got acidity, that's a drop in pH. Ammonia means a very rapid rise in pH. Ah. That happens in a lot of diesel powered vehicles. So that's your third test, so color, clarity, 
pH, any pH, if you do measure pH, 7 to 11 is your pass. That's a broad range. So you've got, as you asked about organic acid technologies, <laughs> extended life coolants, they're lower on the pH scale. Conventional coolants, fully formulated coolants, are higher on the pH scale. So that's where anywhere between 7 and 11 is a pass. Got it. The fourth test is the water glycol content. I always ask when I write exams, what's the best way to remove heat from any engine? Water. Water in a cooling system is what removes the heat. The ethylene glycol in a cooling system prevents it from freezing. That's the purpose of ethylene glycol. It doesn't help to transfer the heat. The, your boiling point or raising the boiling point, that's done by your pressure cap. We put a pressure cap on a system and we raise the boiling point to 265 degrees. So you've got water and glycol. 100% of factory fill across the world is ethylene glycol. 50% water, 50% glycol. That equals minus 34 degrees Fahrenheit, approximately minus 37 degrees Celsius, as we're talking to folks outside of the northern border or yeah, southern border. Yeah. So that's the perfect world. In a typical cooling system, when a vehicle goes down the road, a year later, if you're going to check it, a year and a half later, or six months later, your 50-50 is going to change. It's going to change to greater. 51% glycol, 52% glycol. In a typical Class A tractor going down the road in a two shift per day driving cycle, they lose five gallons of water a year. Tremendous amount. Silicone hose, where these vehicles have a lot of silicone uh, hose. It comes out. It permeates the water, just like you sweat. Yeah. That's what happens to the hoses. No. So it is important for that fourth test to use a refractometer. Don't use test strips to test water glycol content or freeze point. You will be off, and I prove this every day in training, you will be off by 40 to 50 degrees. So you can use a test strip in a typical coolant that has quality inhibitors there today, and it's gonna read minus 60. When you use the refractometer, it's gonna say minus 10. So you can be off by a lot of temperature, false readings. The inhibitors today are very strong in these type of extended life coolants. The red dye is in a lot of coolants. The strong yellow dye in these coolants, they give you false readings using a test strip. Uh. So an analog refractometer is the typical one. You look through the sight glass, you, yeah. you drop a couple drops on the screen, you look up at the light, and it gives you a blue wall meets a clear wall. Wherever they meet that line, that's your water glycol content or freeze point. Always love for you as in a fleet to maintain your cooling system glycol water content at 40% glycol, 60% glycol to 40% water, 60% water. That at 40% glycol, 60% water equals minus 12 degrees. So if I'm working in Houston or Florida, minus 12 degrees, it's a perfect world, right? How often do we get that cold? If I'm up in Canada, my customer, Greyhound Bus, they actually buy coolant from Old World from me that's blended at 60% glycol. That's minus 65 degrees. Hmm. Canada cares about cold. So 50 50 is the perfect world. The OEs want you to keep it between that minus 12 to minus 65. They don't want to see more than 60% glycol because what's the best way to remove heat? Water. Yeah. You have to have water in the system. What's found is that if you operate in these perimeters, your glycol age naturally. Your glycol degrades over time. It, heat today, cool off tonight. Heat tomorrow, cool off the next day. That glycol will continue to degrade. Over the course of five years, six years, it's, it's degrading naturally. But if you start to raise the temperature of that system where you don't have enough water in there, the glycol accelerates its age. So we have to have water to remove the heat. You got to be sure you got the right blend, right. the 50-50 yeah. blend. If you have more water than 60%, what are you doing to the inhibitor package? You're diluting it. Mm -hmm. So once you start to remove the inhibitors, you're susceptible to rust and corrosion, block cavitation, liner pitting if it does have a liner in that diesel engine, and so on. So. Wow. Okay. So uh, that's forward test measures. Oh, the, oh, we got five, right? You got five. I'm you sorry. One, right? Yeah. A, B, C, D, and, and E. E. Yeah. <laughs> Carm, don't move on until I finish. Yeah. So the fifth test 
in reality, we have inhibitors in the yeah, system. Yeah. We have chemical protection. There are test strips that actually test the chemistry. So in old technology, we always tested the nitrites. There are many fleets and mines that still use old technology. It works very well in their application. A simple test strip to test all my inhibitors there in conventional coolant, the inhibitor being nitrite. Today's technology, organic acid technology, there are test strips that simply read pass, low, or fail. Did somebody dilute my inhibitors in my system? So the test strip is a simple pad test strip for a technician. Does it pass or does it fail? If it fails in an automotive situation, two, three, four gallon system, it's easier to drain out and flush it out with a little water and then refill the system. In a heavy duty system where it's 15 gallons or some sort of off-road vehicle that may be 200 gallons, we can easily add those inhibitors back into the system. Simple, called extenders or converters. That's the inhibitors that are in organic mm. acid technology. We can re-inhibit the system. Wow, color, sample. Color, for, clarity. Co co yeah, color, clarity, right. pH or smell. Right. Water glycol content, yep. and then test for inhibitors. That's right. There's your five simple test procedures. Done. This was worth the yep. price of admission for everyone today. They thought they were tuning in to hear something about business, right? right. This yeah. is all about business. Well, it's it about is. taking care of your customers. Yeah. It's about and doing the right thing. Yesterday, I trained at a bunch of folks here, business yeah. owners, and presented. I, I used the word trained, but I'm the senior field technical trainer. Yeah. I'm the heavy-duty business development guy for old world industries. But when I do a lot of presentations like yesterday, it's generic. Hi, I'm from old world. This is what we do. These are my brands. And then I go through slides two yeah. through 26, and then goodbye, I'm old world, and please buy my product. In the middle, I leave out the selling part. And yeah. that's what we're doing kind of here. People today, don't I want think. selling today in training. And to your point, they don't want to go and hear commercials right. while they're absorbing all this new stuff. So we're, Tracy and I are having breakfast here. Joe comes in. Hey, am I in the right room? It was so cool to meet this guy from New York, right? Bronx born and raised. Was born and raised. Yeah. And we, so I started to talk to him about DEF uh, because frankly, I just don't know enough about it. So <laughs> the stage is yours. Help us understand how what well, this is all about. In 2009, the government kind of wants to clean the Clean Air Act. And it, it started back in the 90s with moving from diesel fuel to low sulfur diesel fuel. We saw a lot of issues with the uh, different pumps, standardine pump, fuel pumps failing because they needed the sulfur. Then we kind of got into the early 2000s and we started to see EGR systems, ex exhaust gas recirculation. We're trying to remove the contaminants in the air. Then we got into the diesel particulate filter. So try to remember this. You've got a diesel engine that more than 74 ha horsepower. It had an EGR hung on there, stainless steel, heat transfer. So now we're taking coolant and getting it even hotter. We're going now at taking that exhaust and sending it through another filter, an exhaust filter to catch the black carbon that comes out of a tailpipe. So we go into the diesel particulate filter, that's a DPF. So we got EGR, we got DPF. We're injecting fuel on the face of that deep diesel particulate filter to get it super hot. Because coming out of that DPF, we continue with the exhaust. This is where we add on the SCR system, selective catalytic reduction. We have a, a, a DEF, a diesel exhaust fluid tank. We have an injector that's going to inject the diesel exhaust fluid at that point coming out of that exhaust, which is extremely hot. In some instances, a thousand to 1100, 1200 degrees. When the exhaust, when the diesel exhaust fluid enters that heat, it turns to ammonia. Now that exhaust continues into what's called the SCR, selective catalytic reduction. Folks in the automotive world hear the word catalytic converter. In a diesel engine, it's an SCR. We now enter with that ammonia and the exhaust gases, we enter that catalyst and it turns it into, coming out the tailpipe, water and nitrogen. That's what comes out the tailpipe. This is how we clean the exhaust. So driving behind a truck years ago, you always saw that big black puff of smoke coming out and you saw six or eight or 10 feet of that trailer was black up top because yeah. the pipes always black. Right. You don't see that any longer. 
Anything past 2009 on road had to be with an SCR system with 74 horsepower or more in the diesel engine. So Off road, 2016, every piece of equipment had to do it. Railroad probably came along in 17, 18. Today, the marine business, if you put diesel engines in your work boat, has to have an SCR system in there. So diesel exhaust fluid. What's in it? That's a great question, right? Two ingredients. Automotive grade urea, fertilizer, liquid, right? So even if it's produced as a solid a prill, we turn it into a liquid. How do you make this urea? Well, urea is made by natural gas. It's a fertilizer. 70% of the cost to make urea is natural gas. So the term Bosch process to, to take and convert hydrogen into urea. So here we go. We've got... 32.5% pure urea and 67.5% deionized water. Damn. Pure water. That's all that's in that 2.5 gallon jug or drum or tote or bulk delivery of DEF. We must meet the American Petroleum Institute standards, API, for, U, for, for DEF. Uh, ISO 22241 is the code the whole written specification, it must meet it. My DEF and my competitor's DEF are all exactly the same. They must meet API standards. If not, they're not going to work. Well, I kept mentioning to you earlier today, 32.5% urea, 32.5% urea. In blending at facilities, we're constantly testing it because the codes on a diesel engine will go off if that urea is off by 0 0.7, 0 0.7. So 32.5% is perfect. So if some way, somehow it got diluted with water and we're at 31.7, the code will go off. Your engine will start to decelerate. You'll start to lose power. You need to kind of correct the situation if that happens. 0 0.7. All right. So if I continue buying great brand quality products, why would it start degenerating? Well, EF has a shelf life. Ah. Just like milk has a shelf life. Okay. It can last maybe 10 days in your refrigerator, but if you put it on the kitchen counter, the warm, yeah. you leave it out yeah. there all day, Spoils. it'll be sour by yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. DEF will go sour. What affects DEF? Heat, sunlight. What doesn't affect DEF is cold. So if your vehicle operates in the northern part of the United States or in Canada and it's 10 below zero, DEF freezes at 12 degrees. So in your system, the same way you would start your vehicle and warm it up just to get the fluids warm, the DEF has a heater, it will start to defrost or melt. There's no issue in running ice cold or frozen DEF in your system. What you want to be careful of is like on a Friday evening and you fuel up, get ready to work Monday morning or something like that. You don't want to fill up your DEF tank all the way in the winter. What happens to water when it freezes? Water is one of the few liquids that expands when it freezes. So I actually had a big fleet, diesel engine fleet, that was leasing vehicles in Wisconsin. And that is exactly what was happening. The DEF was freezing in their tanks and the DEF pump was in the tank and it was cracking the pump and actually the sensors going up to the firewall. We were growing the DEF corrosion all the way up to the firewall. So it was just a simple addition to the bulletin of how to test DEF. Don't fill up your tanks all the way because when it freezes, it's going to expand and you'll create issues. So talk about DEF shelf life. So a typical two and a half gallon jug, or if you're buying a drum for some reason, shelf life is three years. What removes that shelf life is excessive heat. So there's an actual a bulletin that I put out to show you three years, and then at this temperature, it's one year. As we get to 95 degrees, it's probably 90 days. Don't buy DEF and, and put and yeah, like, oh, it's on sale. Let me buy two skids, put one in the trailer in the back in July. It gets 100, 120 degrees. You're going to take that shelf life of three years and turn it into 30 days. So you want to be careful in storage and buying DEF, buy as needed. Simple as that. Smart. So if you're going to walk into a shop yeah. off the shelf and buy DEF, 
in the places at 95 degrees because the air got crashed, you may have an issue. Well, here's one of the big things I do. Old world private labels, a lot of DEF. We do a lot of retail DEF, our blue DEF, our clean DEF, other brands of DEF. Anytime a retail store manager, and I talked to hundreds and hundreds of them. I just came from an event for O'Reilly's down in Dallas, Texas, 8,500 attendees. Imagine that. 8,500. I couldn't believe it. But I talked to hundreds of them coming through our station, our booth, talk about coolants. And I always explain to them, when you put a display in your window, you must educate your managers to rotate that inventory. Because you're in Texas, you're in California, you got a display sitting in the window. That sun is shining on the back of that display. Those bottom cases are going to get hot and accelerate its age. So just rotate inventory. And some guys go, oh, we sell so much of it, I never worry about that. Well, that's great. But what about that other store that doesn't sell a whole lot of it? So just be aware. There are date codes on every container that we produce for DEF. That date code tells me where it was produced whether in California or Alabama or Illinois or in New Kensington, Pennsylvania. It tells me what year it was produced and what day of the year it was produced and what batch number that day. So these day codes are important to me so that if there was ever an issue, we can run the, that day code and know exactly where it was produced and when. My brain is fried. No, it's not. There's some simple test procedures for your shop technicians that if they are working on a diesel and a code is thrown. A couple reasons codes get thrown when DEF is good, A, the vehicle has been running all day and it's hot. DEF is kept warm in the tank. Well, my DEF, I'm going to go add two and a half gallons to the system. Well, I'm grabbing a container that could be 30 degrees out. I'm pouring it into hot. It throws a coat. Just shut the system off. Let those two fluids become one ambient temperature. Start it up. The coat goes away. In some instances, DEF, the tank's starting to run low. There are sensors in there. Remember, it's hot, right? We get a steam bubble on the sensor. Well, code gets thrown. Well, there's nothing wrong with the system, nothing wrong with the DEF. The code's thrown because there's a steam bubble or an air bubble on that sensor. Add two gallons of DEF, and the code goes away. So now let's look at what do I need to do to test my DEF? A code went off and everything's right. Take a sample out of the tank. It needs to look as clear and color as water. So it needs to look like water. And when you put it up to the light, it should have no debris, nothing wrong inside the system. You can smell it. It can smell like ammonia. Remember, it's urea. It's ammonia. It doesn't have to smell like ammonia. I just don't want to smell like gasoline or fuel because mm -hmm. I have seen this. Drivers go over in the winter with diesel, fuel, additive, and they put it in the wrong cap. Ow. Oh, look at that. And they put an ounce in there or two ounces in there, which is going to change the color. Mm -hmm. So let's be careful. Make sure there's no oil floating on top of your def or no debris in there. So color, clarity, odor, same, similar, no charge for these type of tests. Now you want to test the DEF for its content of urea. 32.5 is perfect. 0.7 is allowable. If you're off from that, if for some reason you're 28 or 27, you need to drain that system out and refill the system. If for some reason you're over-concentrated, I can't tell you why you would be over-concentrated other than they left the cap off while they drove around all day and the water evaporated. If you're over-concentrated on DEF to like 33.5 and you're at 38. And you're getting that from the refractor. Well, there's a refractometer specific for diesel uh, exhaust fluid. Uh, so a okay. refractometer is used to test coolants. Mm -hmm. They have refractometers to test DEF. There's also, those are called analog refractometers. Yeah. An yeah. analog refractometer, you look up to the light through the sight glass. There's a handheld computer, a digital refractometer. They work on coolants. They work on DEF. They work on honey if you're going to go up in Vermont. They work on wine content if you're going out to California. We're going to have to get one, Trace. Yeah. <laughs> so just in, in kind of understanding a digital refractometer comparison in price to the other refractometers in the industry, there's the old-fashioned, I don't know if you remember, the the bulb type of tester. Yeah, I do. You know, that very few shops still use them. Some do. I constantly explain to the people that do use that type of bulb refractometer, the glycol saturates the plastic mm -hmm. and it gives you your reading. 
the by weight. Well, if you don't wash those little pellets or the little needle in there, the little floating balls that are in there, you need to wash your balls every day when you use that type of refractometer. They're, they're reliable if you keep them clean, but they do get saturated with the glycol. They're not as accurate. Are there a lot around anymore, do you think? You yes, see because why? The price. $4, $5 yeah, versus an analog, which is upwards of 100 or $125 versus a digital that could be upwards of five. That's a computer. Yeah. It's a, probably $500. How do you wash? What do you wash the balls with? Soap and warm water. Okay. Simple. As, if a guy's still going to use So that. take them in the shower with you. Well, you can do that. But I mean, I've seen educated consumers, a guy working in a school bus world, Saturday morning, the old timer, I'll call him that. He goes out there with a warm bucket of water and that type of refractometer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he rinses it bus after bus. He's cleaning it. So he's you, doing it the right way. So Joe, when you go out and visit fleets, what do you see that they're doing right, doing wrong? The biggest thing, hey, my Schneiders, JB Hunts, Walmart fleet, UPS and FedEx, they're educated, right? And they make sure they're technicians we have technicians retiring. We have technicians always being hired. They always keep up the speed on education. But it's funny when I do go into a fleet, small fleet, medium-sized fleet, a transit fleet somewhere, and I ask the question, what do you do for cooling system testing? Well, we make sure the surge tank's full. And that's it. That's their test. So it is vitally important, and I'm repeating myself again, 40% engine downtime is coolant related. It's important to at least have some sort of program in place with those five test procedures. You'll eliminate 99% of your, any issues in cooling system. Things change. The radiators have changed. So we went from copper steel radiators to fabricated aluminum. There are different manufacturers. There's a lot of manufacturers in, in, in fabricated aluminum radiators today or heat transfer. And the issue is that factory build today, depending on where their source of heat transfer and where they're buying from, we see issues. We see issues in various OEs, everything from that light tower on the highway at midnight that's lighting up the highway and they got uh, three miles of light towers. The OE changed their source of heat transfer. They bought a different radiator. And suddenly the call, what's wrong with your coolant? Let's talk about what coolant you're buying. Well, they were buying conventional nitrided coolant and they changed the source of radiator and that created this issue. So they needed to move to today's technology. Mm -hmm. What is factory fill across the world? Organic acid technology. I only know of two people that still use a nitrided OAT as their factory fill. Only two. No one in Asia uses it. No one in Europe uses it. No one on road in North America uses this type of technology. Things have changed. So we are in a nitrite free world. So buying coolant in automotive or heavy duty today, that NF word is not a cuss word. Yeah. Nitrite free is yeah. what we're looking at. Yeah. It's amazing for to hear you say that when I go into a fleet to talk to them and I explain to them this 40%, four out of 10, engine problems, downtime, do they really pay attention? Do they, do they make the commitment to change? Any fleet will, they will. with an education. Sure. You got to teach them. Yeah. And your type of listener here, let's kind of face the facts. They're automotive, right? Yeah. But they may be trying to get that local guy yeah. with 10 pickup trucks. To, to what a sell point. That. What yeah. a sell point, huh? They should be follow Cummins rule. Cummins bans certain technology. So there are inhibitors in the industry. So I don't want to pick on a brand, right? That's not why I'm here today. But there are inhibitors in certain brand of coolant that come and says in a bulletin, a 12 page bulletin, do not use this inhibitor. Well, how does the end user know where that inhibitor is? I do because that's all I do for a living is I know inhibitors that are in Dexcool and Toyota Red and my products and competitors products. So when I look at failure, just kind of earlier this week, we had mine out in Sparks, Nevada, had three engine failures for Cummins. And the customer sent me his findings. The tote itself had my sticker on the tote. We analyzed, he analyzed the coolant that was in the tote. For some reason, we don't have a clue why, but the distributor 
delivered a competitor's coolant banned by Cummins with my label on the toe. Mm. And I said to the guy, that is not my coolant. Now we're going to prove it by an independent lab in Phoenix, Arizona. So failures occur. My job in the industry, I get calls every day. Why did this fail? And I can pinpoint as to why a failure occurred, whether it's water pumps, Liner pitting, cavitation, yeah. seal failure, you tell me. You love your job, don't you? Well, I have a lot of fun doing it. My job evolved from selling, being in sales with Penray and selling the inhibitors. Penray was big in filtration, cooling system cleaners. So we didn't touch base on that. Make sure you ask me about that. We evolved to selling coolant. And uh, my knowledge for 21 years of studying technology has helped me get this position at Old World that it evolved from managing specific accounts to being the field trainer, yeah. to being the research guy and going into mines and finding out what's wrong. But you're helping people and you're educating. Yeah. I, mean, I think those are two great callings. Yeah. yeah. And my boss loves what I do at Old World and he wishes he had two more. Of me. All right. Okay. We, Joe's got to have a raise here. Just, uh, just saying. Yeah. Cooling system cleaners. Tell me right. about it. So, so let's kind of just re realize I have a system that's aged with rust and corrosion. I have a system that maybe the water... I got that Bronx accent. I think you just water? found that out. Yeah, water. water, right? <laughs> water. All right. So I listen, I, just so you listeners notice, I'm a San Francisco Giant fan. I am not. Mm. I am not a Yankee fan. So I just want to make sure. That All right. Now we know. Yeah, just to make sure. So, so why do we have to clean the system? Water has a lot of calcium, magnesium in it. So if you're using tap water from certain areas, you may dilute the system with a lot of calcium. So we always sell coolant that's blended as 50-50. So if you've got rust corrosion, you've got scale buildup from the calcium, magnesium, you need an acid type of cleaner. So you're going to drain the system out, put the cleaner in, run it for a couple hours, flush that out, right? Drain it out and flush it out with water until it's clear and then refill the system. Well, then we have a second failure. We have a transmission cooler failure, and we're putting tranny fluid in there. We have an oil cooler failure. We're putting oil into the system. We have an injector cup failure. Diesel injector cups leak fuel into a cooling system when they fail. So I have carbon in my antifreeze. What do I do? You need an alkaline-based cleaner to clean out that failure. So you should not just go to the shelf and, oh, engine cooling system cleaner. Yeah, if it's scale or, or rush corrosion, that'll be fine. There's products on the automotive shelf, and then there are products on my shelf, or maybe the Cummins distributor, Fleet Guard distributor, that are for heavy-duty cooling systems. CAT has their own cleaner out there also. So there's heavy-duty for oil. That's where your oil contamination is a lot more prevalent than in, a, in an automotive world. So know why you're cleaning the system. This is going to be an episode that we can point everyone to by being so educated on cooling systems. But anyone who is attempting to be a really great fleet maintenance service provider, got to listen to this episode because I'm going to assume, and I may be wrong, that a lot of typical automotive aftermarket service professionals that decided to get into the fleet business may not necessarily know this in the depth, Joe, that you know this. Mm -hmm. And I think this episode can go a long way in helping everyone realize that it's great information and we're not going to make you an expert with this episode, but please respect all that you've told us to pay attention to this stuff. I, I find it fascinating because I love to learn this stuff. So the last thing on my mind is diesel exhaust fluid. I talked about the simple testing and procedures. I talked about that it freezes at 12 degrees, right? There is no additive to lower the freeze point of DEF. You cannot do that. It will freeze at 12 degrees. Freezing it doesn't affect it. It actually extends its life. So take a gallon of DEF, put it in the freezer, a year later, take it out. It's still good for a couple of years. There are companies that are about to come out. Okay, so how we are in September will be 15 years in this country of DEF. The issue has been that some DEF systems, we start to see the injector, the catalyst, the exhaust pipe create this white crud. We'll call it like a, a crust and it grows. Technicians and in inspecting systems. And again, there is an RP373 from the Technology and Maintenance Council for the American Truckers Association discusses 
this crud. So DEF, just by leaving it out on the cap or opening a cap, closing a cap, you'll start to see a little white crud. In a system, typically, that white crud will continue to dissolve. So when you start a vehicle up and it runs all day long, then you shut it down, that DEF, that white crud or the liquid, is coated the whole inside of the engine. When you start the vehicle up tomorrow, the DEF flowing through the system should wash it away. In some instances, whatever vehicle specific or engine specific, we start to build up that crud. It doesn't wash away. It just happens in a system. So it's up to the technician. That's part of inspection. Let me look at the injector if I can, make sure this white buildup is not growing on there, or let me look at the catalyst and make sure. You should inspect it every six months. But is there a list that of these vehicles that are more susceptible to it? No, it's you can have a whole bunch of Ford Super Duties and 5% of the vehicles are doing it. Got Why? It. Okay. So now the reason I'm even reaching out for this, it's part of the inspection that you see in RP373. What the end user is going to find out is that they have, we at Old World do this, there's an additive to prevent this from happening. The problem is 32.5 is a perfect world, 0.7 throws codes. If I market this pint bottle or quart bottle of this additive, how much do you put in? Your truck is a seven gallon system. The next truck is a 13 gallon system. The next truck's a 23 gallon system. By adding this, I'm changing the 32.5. Your truck is half full. That truck is three quarters full. The third truck is full. How much do you add? So be careful. Educated consumer is someone we want to deal with. We Got want it. to educate them. Be careful how you use this additive. At Old World, this is what we did. I explained to you before that Blue Def, and we private label a ton of Blue Def, and then there's the competitors. Blue DEF has been exactly the same for all these years until a couple years ago. We took this additive and we go to the blending facility and we blend it into our blue def to keep it at 32.5. So you as an end user, you don't have to buy this additive. You don't have to guess how much I should use. Our blue def platinum is on the shelves across the U.S. at all these auto parts stores from Napa to AutoZone to O'Reilly's. And I'm missing somebody there. I know that. I apologize. But it's on there. And the end user sits there and he says, why should I pay more for this blue def platinum versus a clean def or blue def? And why should I pay more? It has this inhibitor in there. Got it. Mr. Customer, did you take your vehicle last year back to the dealer because it threw a code and you spent $500? No. Then buy the conventional. You don't have an issue with this coding. Yes, I did have this issue. You did? Buy the platinum. Upgrade the platinum. Spend an extra buck a gallon or whatever it is, and your issue will not exist. You will, that'll keep this. You see, that's clean. where all the great technology comes in, where you're constantly reformulating, evaluating what works, what doesn't, what challenges that there are, right. and to, to come up with a platinum product to answer an issue in the industry. Right. Yeah. So I'll be on the floor today here all at right. the Max event. Yeah. And having Thank fun meeting all the oh, business owners yeah, here yeah. and shop guys. Oh, this is great. Thank you yeah. so much, Joe Long. Appreciate yeah. this. This was a very, very enlightening and exciting. And my brain is now Swiss cheese. There you go. And I can't wait to go back and listen to this again. That's it. Thanks, Joe. Well, safe travels well, to Buffalo and we'll talk soon. One more time. Joe Long, Old World Industries. Appreciate you being here. Oh, Thank the you. senior field technical trainer. That's it. Thanks, buddy. Thank you.